I'm going to hand it over to you. Take it away. Cool. Thanks, Latko. Yeah, I'm thrilled to roll out the latest episode of the IBM Qiskit Live Quantum Seminar Series dedicated to the research and academic communities. I'm your host, your Kamiko from IBM Quantum Research. And today I have the pleasure and privilege of hosting Slatko Minev from IBM Quantum, whom you all know very well. Slatko today will talk about probabilistic error cancellation with sparse poly Limblad models on noisy quantum processors. Let me introduce him uh, briefly. Slatko received his BA with distinction from UC Berkeley in the group of Irfan Siddiqui and his PhD with distinction from Yale University in the group of Michel de Vore in 2018 after which he continued the research position at IBM Quantum. He is the team and tech lead of IBM Quantum Device Design and Analysis Qiskit Metal Project and the lead of Qiskit Leap Research. Slatko has received many awards for his work, including MIT Technology Review, which named him one of their 35 global innovators under 35. Also, his dissertation work on catching and reversing a quantum jump mid-flight was selected as the top math, physical sciences discovery in Discover's top 50 stories of the year. He's a laureate of the presidential John Atanasov Award. For his science outreach work and leadership, Zlatko was awarded with the highest Yale award for this Yale Jefferson Award for public service. That's all. There you go, Zlatko. The floor is yours. All right, Mirko. Thank you for embarrassing me with a very long introduction. Um, good morning to you again, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. It's my pleasure and privilege to be your speaker today and to share with you this project that uh, I started about two years ago now in a chat I had with my good, good colleague, Kristen Tem. And later we completed with the uh, really great work from Kristen and Ivo Vandenberg uh, in particular. Let's start with the question that I think can help motivate the stock. What do you think is the biggest challenge facing quantum computing today? Please reply in the comment chat box uh, below on YouTube. I'd love to hear what you think. And Mirko, while we let everyone type in the chat, would you mind sharing some of the comments that you already see in the box? Yeah, sure. So some of the comments we got is the current inability to create fault tolerance systems. Uh, making qubits with longer coherent times, prove quantum supremacy, uh, reach a useful quantum advantage, uh, scalability of those quantum devices. Um, some people mention noise is the biggest challenge we have right now. Um, yeah, I think with that, I can't type and see all your comments on the slide. So I collected here responses from authoritative figures on the matter, tweets on Twitter. <laughs> and I can hear echoes of a lot of what Mirko just read to us uh, that echoes what you said. You know, There are many challenges and ideas from air correction overheads, hardware development, decoherence, loss, heat, stability, algorithm development, modularization, hype expectations, gravity, even mat material quality, need for more CSEE talent, engineers, and noise. At least, to me, noise was the noisiest in all of this, the one that stands out loud and clear above all the other ones. To me, first and foremost, the biggest challenge facing quantum computing today is noise. Noise causes errors. Noise corrupts experiments. Corrupted experiments aren't trustworthy. Errors, of course, due to noise limit our computational reach. And the peskiest thing about noise is that noise is unavoidable. Even in classical computers, Noise can be reduced, suppressed, never fully removed. Noise is really here to stay. So it's important to deal with noise. One day, quantum error correction, as someone mentioned in the chat, should be able to overcome noise, of course, at a cost, no free lunch. But what do we do now, even then, since noise is unavoidable, before full to full tolerant quantum error correction? I'd like to take a little bit of inspiration by listening to music on my noise canceling headset when uh, preparing for this or other work. Noise cancelling headsets, of course, work by characterizing the noise in the environment and then using that knowledge to tailor and inject additional noise. You're adding more noise to the system to precisely cancel the original noise to yield a noise free experience. We could then ask can there be some very loose analogy between noise cancelling headphones for quantum and quantum computing? 
end error mitigation schemes for quantum computing. <clears throat> so being very cavalier and having some fun with it in this talk, I'll try to answer this in the affirmative. Before diving into all the details, the high level take home messages are the following. One, we cannot get rid of noise, but that's okay because we can now actually learn the noise with in an accurate, efficient and scalable way so as to allow us to then cancel that noise uh, by injecting more noise, but tailored one, just like if you want uh, very loosely what noise canceling headsets do. Now, naturally, this doesn't come for free. There is a cost. There is a sampling overhead that we will explore as we go through the rest of the slides in this talk. So in this talk, we'll start with the big ideas first, introducing noise canceling, the method of probabilistic error cancellation. What is the big idea and why was this not possible until now? Then we'll get into the main challenge, <clears throat> which has to do with learning the noise and the exponentially complex uh, quantum noise, which we solve by using what are called sparse poly Lindblad models. And we'll introduce those as well as experiments on learning the noise across a large quantum chip using then finally that data to mitigate a trotterized Ising evolution, a somewhat common and rather difficult uh, simulation if you want, uh, that has a lot of gates and a lot of depth and so on, to see just how well does this work and how well did we learn the noise. Spoiler alert, learning and canceling the noise works surprisingly well, actually it exceeded my expectations, but of course it does come at a cost. So since we have a very diverse audience from beginners on the seminar to world experts on the seminar who speak and come back as also um, part of the audience, I will start by getting everyone on the same page. And I apologize to uh, the experts for the ramp up. So let's start with the big ideas first. Imagine an idealized n qubit digital quantum circuit that looks something like this. It can be decomposed into a layered construction comprising a single qubit gate layer, followed by a multi qubit ideal gate layer, noise free, followed by another single qubit gate layer, followed by another multi qubit gate layer, so and so on, until you ultimately perform a measurement in some computational basis. This construction is very general and common, but it's a little bit unrealistic. Because, of course, we have to remember that in real devices, each gate is subjected to noise. Single qubit gates typically have order of magnitude higher fidelity over two qubit or multi qubit gates. So, for the most part, to keep things easy for now, we can restrict our attention to thinking that all the noise is attached to the multi qubit gates. Each multi qubit gate is then necessarily and unavoidably preceded by a noise map which we'll denote here by lambda, that can typically be understood as a linear operation that is completely positive and trace preserving and is representable by a giant four to the n by four to the n matrix, at least in principle. And this characterizes more or less your digital quantum computer type of circuit. Now, if the noise is just the matrix, Why not invert the matrix and apply that inverse to cancel the noise and then get a noise free expectation value? In the way that this slide suggests, in principle, why not just apply an operation that is precisely the inverse of lambda one right before lambda one and so and so on. Um, you can type in the chat what your reasons are, but you can already see some of them on the slide. For instance, I can imagine all the theorists in the room right now getting up and jumping up and down and <laughs> screaming, you know, well, the inverse of this completely positive trace preserving map is not in general a completely positive trace preserving map. It has negative eigenvalues. It's unphysical. Uh, it's not CPTP and so and so on. You would need to recover and know some of the information that was lost. So there are many reasons why you can't do this. To undo the effect of decoherence for noise, you really need access to the lost information, say from a T1 or a T2 event, which we just simply do not have and cannot have. Luckily, my great call, my colleague Kristen Tem 
with Sergey Bravi and Jay Gambetta proposed this beautiful theoretical idea suggesting that in principle the inverse can be implemented on average and this method is called probabilistic error cancellation. Since probabilistic error cancellation is a central idea of this talk, I'll spend a few slides to explain it on a simple toy model. Zlatko, we have a question on, uh, on the noise map. If you can go back one slide. Somebody is um, asking why, yes, uh, why do you consider trace preserving maps and not dampening ones? Uh, great question. So trace preserving, um, so trace preserving means essentially that you're keeping track of all of your ensemble. If your map doesn't preserve the trace, usually you're looking at a quantum trajectory or an unraveling, which we'll actually look at and get to. Um, was that the question? Yeah, I believe so. Great. Yeah. And, you know, CPTP maps, completely positive trace preserving, are not the only ones, of course. You, there are slightly more general constructions. You can have non Markovian noise, noise that varies in time. But this is the usual and assumption for any Markovian linear type of noise. And we'll see that in practice on the devices and experiments we look at, it holds quite well. And there are ways to more or less restrict ourselves to this. Of course, there's always um, you know, some more complexity here that we do see in the experiments at some level. Thank you, Mirko. Thanks for the questions. Keep, keep them coming in the chat. Okay. So to continue to explain the idea of probabilistic error cancellation on a simple toy model, imagine a circuit comprising one qubit, one gate, uh, one measurement. And of course, in reality, that gate suffers from noise. To keep things simple, let's make the target gate a simple identity operation. For the noise, lambda here, let's say the effect is to randomly cause a bit flip error. In other words, on an individual circuit realization, uh, the noise that our qubit is subjected to will cause with some probability P, the application of an X gate uh, to the qubit, it will flip the qubit. And with some complementary probability one minus P, nothing will happen. So if you want each of these channels, you can think of as a, as a non-trace preserving operation, but we won't get into that. Uh, the average evolution across the entire ensemble is then given by the probability weighted average between these two circuits. If you want, for the theorist, the, of course, the channel operation here is written uh, in the following way. Uh, where all we've done is added with probabilistic weighing each of the possible quantum trajectories that or unravelings that this channel can have. Now, visually, the way we can think of this uh, on the block sphere is that the state before the application of the noise, uh, the set of pure states look like the block sphere, the unit block sphere. The noise, of course, then causes a contraction on the block sphere all the states shrink towards the middle at some different rate. And so we can then ask, what does this mean for the inverse? Well, what that means for the inverse is that as it's action on the block sphere, the inverse would have to be a dilation. It would have to actually expand uh, the sphere of pure states, which corresponds to information gain. It's purity increasing, and it has therefore negative eigenvalues. So this is a very weird, unusual, not allowed typically quantum operation. But suppose we nonetheless follow this picture of a quantum trajectory and try to construct an ansatz and guess what is the inverse operation here? Uh, because the noise channel lambda has only two components, an identity gate and an X gate, each of which is its own inverse, we can guess that the inverse noise channel must also be composed of trajectories that only have identity gates and X gates. So we can say that with some probability Q, there's an application of the X gate, which hopefully should reverse the noise X applied by lambda. And with some probability one minus Q, lambda will uh, lambda inverse will just apply the identity. If we then look at the unraveling of the total circuit with the inverse and the noise, there's one trajectory occurring with probability one minus Q one 
minus p, that essentially nothing happens in the circuit. Both the noise and the inverse apply the identity gate. No error occurs. And then if you write out all the possible combinations, of which there are only four, in two of them, there's an error on the qubit, either due to the noise or our attempt to invert the noise. And in the final case, there's an error that we've actually managed to cancel randomly by uh, probabilistically by applying the X operator in the inverse when there actually was an error. Of course, we can't correlate the two since we don't know when the errors occur. However, if you try to solve for the condition that these two errors, when weighted in the ensemble average, cancel precisely. So somehow this circuit is the exact, occurs with the negative opposite probability of this circuit. So their sum is zero. And the top circuit plus the bottom circuit occur with unit probability. You can solve that the condition under which this occurs is that the probability for having this bit flip x here is negative the bit flip probability or the error rate divided by one minus two p. In other words, it's a negative quantity. So our probability is now negative, although we'll think of that as a quasi probability and it also blows up. So that seems like a problem if you want to think of probabilistic error cancellation. However, what you can do is to essentially normalize things and turn it into some kind of a quasi probability in the following way. One will define the overall, what we'll call sampling overhead, which is uh, just the absolute value of this uh, quantity Q plus one minus Q. That's essentially our, uh, that will be called gamma. And that's something that grows. And we can use that quantity to then normalize each of the probability, uh, each of the uh, coefficients in the trajectory so that we can now introduce an actual real probability, p sub i, of having this first trajectory where when we sample an identity gate. In order to then also include the sign, which was a negative quantity, which we can't normally do, we can, in classical post-processing, correlate the fact that we applied an i gate here with multiplying classically the measurement outcome by the sign of this quantity. So this is how we can recover the sign. For the other case, when we want to also look at uh, the X gate, it's just the complementary probability P sub X. And similarly, it looks the same in structure. We will post multiply classically by this S sub X. Putting together the um, two different trajectory instances here and averaging them in the following way, where we take the expectation values from each of the results, multiply them by these signs and weigh them by the relative computed probability of occurring, we can almost recover the expectation value that we want that is noise free. However, there's a cost. You have to include this factor gamma. And that's important in this expression because while it allows you to get the bias free estimate, which is awesome, that's what we want. There is a no free lunch theorem, which will tell you that uh, the variance of this expression will grow uh, with gamma. And so that's really the two core messages of probabilistic error mitigation. By doing this trajectory sampling or raveling of quantum trajectories, you can get a bias free estimate at the cost of having to sample more shots. Maybe Mirko, at this point, I'll pause and see if there's any questions or you yeah. tell me if I should go on. We actually have a couple of questions. I was pausing to letting you finish this very nice explanation. Um, okay, so the first question is from Jaime. He is asking, does the inverse of the map uh, lambda always exist? And is there an intuition behind it? Excellent. Thank you. So thanks, Jaime. Good to see you. Um, in principle, no, lambda can, oh, actually, if you go back to this expression, um, you notice that when P is 0 0.5, which means that with equal probability, you completely scramble the noise. In other words, you have a complete worst case scenario noise. You notice that Q blows up to infinity. So this expression is singular. In other words, you have a singular noise map, therefore it doesn't have an inverse. So there are cases like this, but they're extreme cases. They don't really occur in practice as far as I know. 
Perfect. You also answered the following question, which uh, asked how to implement Q if P tends to become one half. Uh, <laughs> it's exactly the case that. Uh... That's right. So you cannot recover it in that case. In that case, you're you're screwed. But the idea, and that that's the same thing as saying, well, if I let my quantum computer run for you know infinity time, uh, I can't undo the noise uh, because the noise has completely dominated and everything's lost. But if the if the time is finite. I still have a chance to recover it because the noise hasn't completely destroyed all the information. It hasn't made it a complete uh, depolarized uh, state. Fantastic. Okay, thank you, Miracle. Thanks guys for the questions. Uh, happy to answer as many as we have time for. So- yeah, We're good, we can proceed, thanks. Thanks. Um, to summarize, this is, probabilistic error cancellation in a nutshell. Okay, just like classical noise canceling headsets or headphones, if we know the noise, we can cancel the noise with more noise, but one that is tailored using random quantum circuits, essentially raveling quantum trajectories to implement the inverse noise map on average. There is a problem, which I'll get to in a second, which has to do with knowing the noise. Um, but I think someone had asked me before the talk, how do I think about this uh, in, a, in a more intuition-based way? So I'll show this slide now, which tries to make draw an analogy between classical random walks and uh, the famous lamppost drunkard's walk and what we have just looked at and done. Uh, imagine a, a lamppost and, and a man that can take a random step either to the right or to the left with some probability bias P, if you look at the distribution of all the random walks this, this drunkard can take, you notice that because there's a probability bias in one direction, let's say to the right, as time goes on, the distribution of where the man is located will tend to drift to the right and will also diffuse. It will, the variance will blow up and the mean will shift to the right. If you imagine that the bias here, P, is the noise that we want to cancel, we just want the man to stay where he is. We want that to be the expectation value. We were looking at the mean of this distribution. You can classically also cancel that drift by adding a second random process. Imagine it's the wind blowing. So now at each time step, the man takes a random step to the left or to the right with P, and then the wind also blows the man either to the left or to the right randomly. But with a probability bias Q that precisely cancels P, it's precisely the opposite probability bias. What you then get is a new random distribution that uh, essentially is bias free. You don't get the bias from the noise to the left or to the right. You stay exactly where you need to be. So it's noise free in that sense. However, there is still the cost that the variances of those two random walks add. And so the variance will blow up. Uh, so that's uh, actually a, a rather accurate translation in my mind of how uh, the, the trade-off comes in the quantum case as well. So this is all beautiful. It's, it's a really beautiful theoretical idea, but it hasn't really worked yet in practice at large scale in large scale quantum devices, despite large theoretical appeal and a few nice demonstrations at the one and two qubit level. And that's because this entire idea critically hinges on knowing the noise near perfectly. Um, to emphasize what we mean by that, for two qubits, the noise lambda is this 4n by 4 to the n matrix, and it requires 255 parameters to be learned in general. As you get to larger circuits, for 10 qubits, there's 10 to the 12 parameters. For 50 qubits, you need 10 to the 60 parameters. Storing 10 to the 60 parameters on a classical computer, mind you, requires about 10 to the 50 gigabytes of, of memory, which is not going to happen. Additionally, these noise parameters can have very low values at 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 5. Uh, in other words, if you have a protocol that learns them with additive rather than multiplicative precision, the sampling cost is going to be very large and expensive. So common techniques like quantum process tomography, um, gate set tomography and so on, uh, really can't handle this larger complexity at, at present. So we need a learning protocol that is efficient, scalable, accurate, can provide a compact tractable representation and can further also be practical that it captures the 
noise in the full device, including crosstalk, correlated errors, parallel gates, so and so on. So these are the challenges we'd like to address. Which brings us to how to overcome these at some level. So in the second part of this talk, uh, we'll focus on learning noise and answer the question, is it really possible to learn the noise with accuracy, efficiency, and scalability at scale? Um, we'll aim to, to learn the noise, mind you, on a real quantum superconducting qubit device, which includes noise sources such as energy relaxation, dephasing, coherent errors, classical crosstalk, quantum crosstalk, state prep and measurement errors, you know, control errors, photon shot noise, one over F charge noise, flux noise, non-equilibrium quasi-particles, leakage, and so on and so on. In other words, all of these noise sources and their effects, we have to somehow account for if we really want perfect noise inverses. So we have to be able to characterize them uh, somehow. For each uh, multi-qubit layer of the circuit, step one is to simplify the noise. Um, so imagine that our noise here is lambda tilde i. That noise includes everything we just mentioned within the Markovian approximation at this level. And it's characterized by some 4 to the n by 4 to the n matrix. So step one will twirl the noise. It's a well-known technique called twirling, which reduces the noise from uh, 4 to the n by 4 to the n matrix to a simpler diagonal 4 to, uh, matrix with just 4 to the n parameters in the poly basis. Now that's still an exponentially large number, but it's a little bit, it's better. <laughs> um, and I'll point you to these references for, for more information on this technique. I won't dwell on it too much, but essentially I'll just mention that we sample here uniformly from the poly group and then average the, each time we run a circuit here, we'll sample a different uh, set of random polys around the noise and uh, will then average over all those Toro instances, which should then effectively make the noise look like a stochastic poly channel, a diagonal, uh, essentially a diagonal matrix in the right basis, which has the special property that its eigenvectors are the polys. In other words, if you apply the noise to a poly, so if you prepare the qubit in the X state and you apply this noise channel, it will simply multiply that X coefficient of the density matrix by some coefficient f, f sub a, which we call the fidelity of the channel. Ideally then to learn the noise, we could use a standard technique such as amplifying the noise so that we can measure the noise in a state and preparation and measurement error free way, spam free way with multiplicative precision so that we can really get at those very small noise parameters. This is akin to randomized benchmarking, cycle benchmarking, K-body noise reconstruction, and, and a whole host of other randomized benchmarking techniques. Now, repeating the channel K times to amplify the noise uh, sounds like a good idea, but of course we have a problem, and that problem is that you can't uh, just have the noise alone, the noise is stuck with the gate. So you have to apply it with the gate. And now this creates a little bit of a challenge and a problem as well, because these are entangling gates, multi-qubit entangling gates, uh, which means that they don't allow you to just so easily apply this. And let me try to explain why. Um, so first, the noise itself has this beautiful structure that the fidelity uh, the um, the noise has eigenvectors that are polys and their fidelity is exactly diagonal. What's going to happen is that the two multi-qubit gates are going to, however, mix all those fidelities together and make some of them unrecoverable. It's going to cause a generacy. And allow me to illustrate on this. Suppose a density matrix component XY comes in, it's hit by the noise, which essentially weighs it by the fidelity FXY. It then goes into the control not gate, for example, just to take some simple familiar two qubit Clifford gate. It's multiplied by a sine plus one. The CX will then convert this fidelity into a YZ gate, uh, into a YZ 
coefficient. The yz coefficient then gets hit again by the noise if you try to repeat it. And so you have now a different fidelity fyz getting mixed with fyxy. So you're starting to mix the different fidelities together. In this particular case, it's easy to undo this mixing because you can take this yz fidelity and using single qubit local gates, you can revert it back to xy. However, there are other um, coefficients of the density matrix, such as xi, in which case that's no longer possible because you would need an entangling operation in order to undo the effect of the CX gate. So for instance, xi coefficient gets mixed with the xx coefficient. And in other words, you lose the ability to independently amplify the noise on either one. You can amplify it now on a product of two fidelities. So this is a fundamental no-go theorem as far as I know, and I'm happy to, if someone can point to us otherwise. Uh, but essentially, there's this degeneracy that you need to get around, and I'll mention how we attempt to do that. So in step two of the layer, A, we're going to undo some of those extra phases um, in a learning protocol that looks like a modification on, on some of these uh, randomized benchmarking sequences. First, we'll initialize the n qubits in some poly basis, denoted here with these gates b1 through bn. We'll then repeat the k times, uh, k over two times, the following uh, sequence, where we first apply the qubit layer. Then we apply some phase gates or identity gates, depending on what basis we prepare it in, uh, doing this many, many times and sweeping the depth of the circuit. There is a question here. Um, Jasper is asking, uh, so if you repeat n times, I guess here it's k over two times, will be a diminishing fidelity? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, you'll see in, yeah, we'll see that in two slides exactly. You get an exponential decay uh, that goes proportional to the fidelity. So the more times you repeat, the, the closer you are to a mixed state. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Mirko. Um, one other thing that we have to handle is that we would like to minimize the effect of spam errors, um, in particular readout errors. And we won't use the more standard A matrix approach. Instead, we'll use this recent um, twirling based readout error mitigation approach that's described in this reference, uh, where essentially we'll also add a random bit flip noise to. Uh, to the um, final stage pre-measurement, and we can then calibrate out and completely remove um, the readout noise. So what does the learning experiment look like? It looks like this uh, sequence where you repeat the gate. Let's take a first experimental example. Let's say that we look at a four qubit circuit that has two C naughts that look like this applied on a Falcon 27 qubit IBM chip. To the question that we just had, as a function of how many times you repeat the channel, because of the noise, you'll see that we um, decay at a rate that is going to be proportional to these fidelities. So the data are the dots, and uh, we've shown some exponential simple fits with these solid lines. The reason that the data doesn't start at one is because here we haven't we haven't uh, added the error mitigation steps so that you can see that the state the spam errors do contribute uh, quite a bit to some of these, although we'll try to get the values without spam. Now you repeat this for all bases. The beautiful thing about this experiment is that to learn the noise here, you only need nine different bases, no matter how many qubits you have in this particular topology. Uh, so it's efficient in that sense. Each time for each basis, you get two to the n curves. Essentially, you can, um, for instance, here with this first blue or teal curve, this particular curve which corresponds to measuring ZIII and ZIII also corresponds in this case to the fidelity 
product of ZIII times ZIII of the noise. The second blue curve corresponds to the product of the noise fidelities of IIIY and IIZZ, and so and so on. And so all these curves give you products of fidelities of the noise because of this mixing together. The um, fidelities are relatively high, and that requires the error bars to be very small. And you can see that here we're looking at error bars at the level of 10 to the minus 4 from these exponential bits, which is kind of that advantage. Now, if we look at um, all of the raw data, and I expand that same figure you saw on the previous slide, we can see that for each basis, you have curves that look very similar. They're different exponential decays. Many of these curves um, actually tell you about the product of the same fidelities. For instance, in basis seven, the first curve, and in basis eight, the first curve tell you about the product of the same fidelities. So essentially, you, you, you have quite a bit of data that we can now try to learn the noise map, although still we have products of fidelities. And also we have here only 255 fidelities to recover since it's four to the power of four. But for 10 qubits and so on, there will be way too many fidelities to really truly recover. So we have to do something smart. And this is where uh, we come to the poly Lindblad model. The idea is that a noise map, while in while written in this way, looks very messy and heavy and has four to the n parameters. Um, you can think of a trivial example where actually while the support is full over the polys, there are very few coefficients that you actually truly need to learn. For example, if you had n qubits and each qubit simply had a bit flip noise, uh, you would still have four to the n poly, you would still have many, many poly terms in here since you get products of all of the different possible errors. For example, you have a noise term that says, well, I could have noise on qubit one and noise on qubit two, although that's just the product of noise on one and noise on two. So really they're less, coefficients. Uh, in, in the way to actually back that out and to understand what that is, is to look at the generator, what actually generates this noise map, which is known as the Louvillian. And for a typical physical system, uh, under Markovian assumptions, the Louvillian has a Lindblad form. So what we can see how well it actually works is to assume that the generator of the noise, the, the Lindblad, has a Lindblad form that only has poly terms because we have a poly noise channel and is going to be a subset of all the possible polys. In particular, we'll pick the subset K uh, where this K will represent somehow the topology of this chip. So essentially, we'll only look at terms, poly terms, that represent the actual graph topology of the underlying chip. Uh, now, taking these assumptions and looking at these fidelity curves with some magic, and there's a lot of technical detail and, and a lot of work and effort went into this, and this is where I'd really like to, to highlight this idea by Kristen and also all the awesome work that Evo pushed and, and drove here, uh, you can then recover the generators of the noise, all of these lambda coefficients, with very low error rates. And you can look at essentially a sparse Lindblad tomogram of the noise of this four qubit circuit. So here we see the noise on qubit one is generated mostly by Z errors that are single product Z errors. Uh, noises on qubit 4, 6, and 7 are pretty low. Then we also see that there's a lot of 2-qubit noise generation, generation terms on 1, 4, and 6, 7, which are the 2-qubit gates. And the pair 4, 7, which doesn't have a gate on it, doesn't have a whole lot of error. So this seems to add up so far. Uh, Mirko, uh, any questions or should I go on? Uh, you can go on. We have a couple of questions we can catch up later. In there. Okay. They were relevant earlier on. Okay, we'll take them at the end. How about that? Um, so what you see here is, oops, what you see here is essentially a fingerprint of the noise. This really tells us precisely what the noise is, and it's unique and I, and uh, tailored to it. 
And there's a lot of technical detail that I'm going to glance over here that's, that, that is detailed in the paper. You can ask now, what about a larger circuit? Suppose that instead of that initial circuit, we look at a larger circuit where we have some more idle cu uh, qubits, because applying a gate on qubit 1, 4 can, of course, cause errors on qubit 0. And qubit 0, meanwhile, has idle errors on it as well. So here's what it looks like. Um, you notice that now the noise tomogram on this uh, seven qubit chain has a ton of Z errors overall on uh, all the qubits. Single qubit Z errors are the dominant error source. That's what this graph can tell us immediately. In particular, qubit seven, which is an idle qubit, has the most amount of single qubit Z error. We notice that the two qubit gates are relatively good uh, were mostly dominated by single qubit generation, single qubit error terms. So here we can use this Lindblad learning techniques to try to diagnose what is the noise and what is the what is a, some of knowledge about the underlying mechanism actually causing this noise. Uh, because these are Z errors, we can hope that by adding dynamical decoupling on all the idle pairs, we can then cancel out the Z errors. So let's let's try to do that and see what happens. So we'll add some very simple XPXM dynamical decoupling sequence, which should cancel Z errors in principle. And let's take now the tomogram of the noise after that. Uh, so very pleasantly happy to see that the dominant Z errors, which uh, on qubits seven, you know, fifteen, and qubit zero, are now completely suppressed by the dynamical decoupling. And we've also managed to reduce uh, quite a bit the Z errors on qubits four and uh, I guess not so much 10. So we can use the, this uh, technique to also diagnose and optimize our experiment, which is essentially what we did. So in the rest of this talk, all the experiments will have dynamical decoupling. You can then ask, this is nice, but we've seen four and seven qubits. Can we scale this to larger circuits? So allow me to show you on a 20 qubit uh, layer. I can no longer show us the tomogram that has uh, too many bars on it. Instead, we can look at a visual picture that shows the exact same data as before, but simply on uh, shown on top of overlaid on top of the graph of the actual quantum processor. So. Here, we're looking at 20 qubit uh, layer where there are C0 gates on each of the circled pairs, such as 2, 3, 1, 4, 7, 10, 12, 15, and so on. There are single qubit errors on each qubit, which are characterized by these circles, uh, the coefficients of which you can read out here. So for instance, we can see that qubit one has a ton of Z errors. It's dominated by Z errors. In fact, most of the qubits are dominated by Z errors even with dynamical decoupling, which is included in this experiment. Qubit 23, for instance, is dominated by a Y error for some reason. And all of the two qubit uh, body terms, or the, the two body terms that generate two these errors, such as XX, XY, XZ, in the Lindblad are shown by these boxes here between each pair of qubits. Okay. And this way we can help understand and diagnose the noise. Although at this point you can ask, this is very nice, it's a very nice graph, but how accurate is this model? You have low error bars, they're self-consistent, uh, but how do we know that this is truly a correct and strong and good representation of the actual noise on the quantum processor? And that's where we come to what I think is the ultimate test, which is to actually use that noise characterization to then precisely cancel out the noise and to mitigate expectation values. So let's start with a simple example that we're already familiar with. Let's go back to the four qubit example where we had uh, two C naughts on qubits one and four, qubits seven and six on this 27 Falcon qubit chip. And let's do one of the simplest things we can, which is to repeat the same C0 layer over and over again, many, many times. And we're going to use uh, the data that we looked at and saw earlier that characterizes this noise layer. And the idea that if you repeat a C0 an even number of times, 
it's just implementing an identity. So we can precisely know that all the measurement answers over here should just be unaffected in principle. The way that the mitigation works is to now insert random um, polygates next to all the single qubit gates that are sampled based on this distribution here. In general, sampling from four to the n parameters of, uh, is very hard. Uh, however, the structure of the sparse and gladian noise model allows you to sample from lambda inverse efficiently. And I'll leave the details for more questions or for those who want to read the paper. So first, let's look at what happens when you use the wrong data set, because uh, I think this is quite telling. And it's actually what happened the first time I ran this experiment is I had calibrated some other gate, and then I used that other four qubit gate to then mitigate the results on this four qubit date, gate versus depth D. So what you observe for the expectation value of all the two qubit uh, I, 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 Z, Z, I, and Z, Z terms, which should be bounded between minus one and plus one, is that instead the mitigation has gone completely wild. You see that uh, instead something that looks like an exponentially blowing up curve that goes somehow proportional to gamma, and you know you're getting mitigated values eighty when they should be one. Uh, so that that's really bad. What that tells you is that this is a very sensitive. Uh, Cancellation is a perfect detailed balance. And so you have to really balance precisely your knowledge with the actual noise model. And if those two don't agree, you're going to get very bad results. Now, what happens if you use the wrong, the correct learning data set? So I've zoomed in here, the scales are completely different. This one goes to 80, this one goes to 1.1. So here's the data now um, without mitigation and at all. I just you know, these curves just decay for the four different components of the repeated CNO. With mitigation, instead now you've, you're seeing that we can now, with the correct learning data set, really recover, you know, the value which should be ideally one, plus or minus, you know, some 0 0.01. Moving to a more complicated and interesting example, let's, in the rest of this talk in the next 10 minutes, look at an Ising model Trotterized time evolution, which simulates um, a spin chain system in this in this case, which has the following standard Hamiltonian, essentially nearest neighbor ZZ coupling and on-site X uh, interaction with some strength H. The way that you can simulate the time evolution of this uh, spin chain is in the following way. Uh, essentially, you can trotterize the Hamiltonian which will then result in circuits that look like this, where for each of the qubits you have, you have a single qubit layer of X rotations of some angle given here. Then you have a multi-qubit layer that looks like this, where you have uh, C knots on all, let's say the even pairs, then you have some rotations around Z, another, the same layer, then you have uh, the complementary layer of C knots on all the other pairs and so on and so on. And this entire sequence gets repeated S times. So it, the first step in the protocol is to then take this circuit and write it in this layer composition. It happens to essentially already be in a layer composition. So this is very easy. Then for each of the layers, in which case there are only two here, we perform the learning ex experiments as we saw before, creating this Lindblad sparse tomogram. And then we're going to use uh, the data from this Lindblad sparse tomogram to randomly sample the inverse noise map and try to average all the circuits with signs together to recover the data. So here's what the actual um, noise learning experiments look like for our two layers. For layer one, we have on four qubits um, a small gamma of 1.03. This is the sampling overhead with a very low error bar, as well as a similar noise strength for our second layer with also a pretty small error bar. These are the fingerprints of the two noises that we want to undo. An interesting quantity to look at is the magnetization, the total magnetization of the entire chain, uh, which is simply defined as the average over the average 
the vector of the average of all the x expectation values, y expectation values, and z expectation values. In practice, what this means is that for our circuit, we have to measure um, all the following observables, and we'll run our simulation for the following parameters. We're not interested in really simulating the Ising model as much as recovering a noise-free um, case of data. To visualize what um, the actual data and results look like, we can plot them in the following way. In the ideal case, no noise. Uh, this is just pure simulation on 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 the quantum on a classical computer using Qiskit Air. Um, the idealized evolution of the Trotterized simulation you know, starts here and uh, essentially then proceeds stepwise in this spiral decay way. In the plane of this total magnetization between Y and Z. Now on the right here, we'll also plot the air, which will be this normalized Euclidean distance in in this uh, plane or of the vectors it will be the difference between what we actually measure with and without pc and the idealized evolution which is shown by this gray dotted curve for the ideal case there's no error let's look at the case when we do everything but pec so we're going to do dynamical decoupling twirling all the noise and twirling the readout and doing readout error mitigation so we're still doing quite a bit of mitigation but you see that even in all this case because of all of the noise processes on the quantum computer the um decay is quite rapid you notice that the error the relative euclidean distance the deviation between for instance this point and, and this point here which is where it should be grows very quickly and that's because the depth of these circuits um, let's say at, at this particular point we've had 60 layers of c naught gates on all of these qubits and the error has just accumulated to to the point where the simulation is no longer really useful even though we have all of this dynamical decoupling twirling and so on in the case of probabilistic error cancellation using those two learned noise models we instead have a rather different picture where on the left we see that uh, the distant the difference between the pec uh, curve the probabilistically error canceled curve, which is in blue, and the ideal curve in dash gray is pretty small and consistently so even up to depth 60 here. Uh, the um, clouds of dots there show you the individual, show you the cloud of distribution of the individual realizations, meaning that in PEC we sample many random circuits. For each random circuit I could show you where uh, the idealized magnetization, where the magnetization measured was. And then if you average over all those magnetization of all the different random circuits, or sorry, uh, then you get, then you get this. If we then put the two plots together and compare what happens in the case of having probabilistic error cancellation and not having probabilistic error cancellation, we notice that for this four qubit case, we really managed to keep the noise pretty low, even at uh, you know 15 trotter steps so that's very nice let us scale let's go to 10 qubits and look at also not just low weight observables which were things like ziii and xiii but also high weight observables and look at the same kind of comparison with and without pc except now it will be on a 10 qubit larger chain so first let's look at the data without uh, probabilistic error cancellation. We're going to look at the highest weight observable, which is highly susceptible and highly sensitive to noise and can serve as a demanding test of the method. Uh, here's the data for uh, seven trotter steps of this uh, 10 qubit model. We'll see that the ideal and actually by step six, you can see that the dis difference between the ideal observable value and the actually measured observable value is, is uh, almost unity. It's basically the noise has completely destroyed uh, what's going on in the actual experiment, or at least it looks that way here, and uh, the error is very high. We can also look at other weight observables such as weight 9, but the story is essentially the same. 
In the case of probabilistic error cancellation, probably it's easiest to highlight uh, the distance here. You notice that the dash curve, which tells us about the idealized evolution, and the blue solid curve, which tells us about the probabilistically canceled error, shows very high overlap, both for the high weight 10 and uh, weight 9 observables. In other words, PC seems to work really well here. One challenge, of course, is that we've had to do many shots and many experiments. And that brings me to error budget and scaling. There's a mitigation sampling overhead, um, which is rigorously bounded in the paper. But here I can summarize it to say that the number of samples per layer, essentially, uh, that you need grows with gamma for a given error threshold you want, such as 1%, for a given probability, let's say you want a confidence of 99%, that's, that's what this means, then you will need this many shots. In other words, it's the sampling overhead scales exponentially with the depth uh, and gamma, but weakly so, since gamma is a small coefficient. And so this plot shows us the value of gamma as a function of the number of qubits in the chain. And you notice that it weakly grows from you know, one point a little bit to roughly 1.6. So if we look at the outlook of what, what does this actually mean, it tells us that P, probabilistic error cancellation works really well. The, the cost may seem high at first because it's exponential, but it's weakly exponential. And even low, even small improvements in gate errors can actually lead to big changes in gamma, which can lead to huge reductions in sampling overhead. So this tells us and reemphasizes, uh, again, the importance of improving uh, fidelities and gates. Even with error mitigation, they still help. And moreover, it tells us that we need essentially runtime or something that allows us to really leverage running quantum experiments as fast as possible and as many as possible with random circuits. In other words, the work serves as a, as a strong example of how classical runtime overheads can be traded for improved quantum computation on noisy quantum processors. And it tells us that we should focus on improving the speed uh, or the execution time for the actual number of circuits. So with that, at exactly at the dot of the hour, I would like to uh, thank you and summarize that I think we've shown that Limbladian learning is accurate, efficient, and scalable and experimentally and in a sense theoretically. It's a powerful characterization and benchmarking tool. It can allow you to diagnose things such as when you need or don't need dynamical decoupling. And it can enable the study and mitigation of noise in quantum processors, hopefully at a new scale, um, and can help help us extend our computational reach a bit further. So with that, thank you. And Mirko, I'll take any questions that uh, we may still have. Thank you, Zlatko, for the awesome talk. Uh, we have a few questions here in the chat. So let me go back to one that uh, was brought up when you were showing the errors on a, on a quantum chip. Somebody was asking if there are uh, axions. What are the errors caused by axions? Uh, yeah, uh, let me see if I can jump back to that slide. <laughs> well, I put most, I could have put here, um, you know, let there be dragons or something like that, or green, uh, the, the, the green monster, I forget what the expression is. Um, but essentially, you know, there are gamma rays and, and other high energy particles and maybe even axions that, that, that are causing uh, all kinds of noise, whether it's in the substrate or, or the input output wiring or heating at various levels uh, that then trickle down and cause errors uh, either through the superconductivity of these chips in particular or or through other effects so it's mostly a catch-all phrase for anything and everything else and maybe at some level some people argue even gravity <laughs> <laughs> gotcha uh, next question by shashi is asking can this noise cancellation idea of inverse or its variation be applied to measurement-based quantum computing or non-gate-based quantum computing? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, sounds like a follow-up work. I think we'd have to think of it. Well, I mean, I, I would think so. Um, 
I would think so. Cool. Uh, Miguel is asking, does PEC take into account which gates are best to use on a specific quantum device? Yeah, great question. So let me jump to the protocol overview here. Um, and, and actually, I think Mirko can probably say even more to this because he's with Mapomatic and so on. But essentially, you have a general quantum circuit. Uh, it doesn't have to be this one. You then need to decompose it into a layered construction like this. Most circuits lend themselves pretty easily to this, not, not every circuit. Um, it's not a unique mapping, so there could be multiple mappings. Also, you can map on different qubits. So those are two things that you can optimize over off the bat. Uh, moreover, you can try to optimize within this decomposition, maybe some of these layers are Clifford layers or so on, so you can push gates left and right, you can add dynamic coupling. You know, this, this can in some part be handled either manually uh, by people or by the transpiler itself. Um, so I think there is a lot of room for optimization in, in general. Yeah. If I may chime in, I would also say that yes, the, um which gates uh, to you, what are the best gates are not exactly chosen by the PC protocol, but more like on the user side or by us, some other mean before actually sending your circuit through the PC pipeline. Yeah, actually that's also true, but <laughs> uh, funny enough in the, in the actual manuscript, um, part of what we did do, or part of what I did do is I ran, the, um, so for smaller chains, let's say four like this, um, what I did do is I ran essentially this chain and this four and this four, you know, and this four, and I learned the noise on all of the different pairs of four around the chip and found the ones using PC that had the lowest gammas because the, the learning takes, you know, takes like 10 minutes or less, whether it's four qubits or 20 qubits, it's, it's scaling variant for these linear chains. Uh, so you can actually use PC if you wanted to, to then find which layers have the lowest gamma and then use those. Hopefully that should correlate to some level with randomized benchmarking. But not necessarily because randomized benchmarking doesn't take into account crosstalk errors and all of this other stuff that the PC does, that the, sorry, the learning does not PC. Cool. Uh, another question from uh, Jaime. Could you comment on how to generalize the noise learning protocol here beyond the assumption on the polytype errors while still making use of the sparsity of the noise channel? Um, it's a good question. I may not fully understand it. I would say I'm not sure that I need to generalize it because I, using uh, this you know, established technique of twirling, I can pretty much always guarantee myself to have poly noise channel. That assumes this can be described by a CPTP map, which is true for Markovian noise. In reality, our noise is not fully Markovian, it's weakly Markovian. Um, so part of the actual experimental running of the protocol means that you, you relearn the noise in practice every two to three hours. Uh, so that's one thing that, that I had issues running with at first. You know, when I was running the first experiments, I had these like six hour long runs and the noise from hour zero to hour six does drift in practice. Uh, but the noise from hour zero to hour two doesn't drift that much. It's good enough. And so really that was a lot of the initial hesitations I had as to why this wouldn't work. It wasn't any of the rest of the physics. It was the fact that the noise does drift. And if it drifts, then you, you know, you're learning at a snapshot. But it turns out in practice, as you see, we can, we, we can really do this and interleave the learning with the actual experimental work for mitigation. Uh, Joel is asking, will there be a Qiskit implementation of PEC? Uh, that's a good question. I, I think there was just the Think demo, I believe at the IBM's Think demo, I think this year was on PEC and I believe it's going to be like uh, as a function, it's going to be available. Um, yeah, go ahead. Let me see. Karan is asking, seemed like with PEC, the variance of error increased with more throttle steps. Is that related to the diminishing fidelity mentioned earlier? Oh, let's see, this is a trick question. So 
uh, the variance of the air increases with more trotter steps. I think uh, I think she's referring to this. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, good question. Uh, this, is, this is a good question. So you do see that the variance of the distribution here is increasing. If you want the yeah, exactly. So that, of course, corresponds to what we said, that um, the larger your sampling overhead, which is determined by the depth. So uh, I think 15 trotter steps here is 15 times 4 depth. So it's pretty, it's relatively deep. And uh, that means that you're multiplying, you're doing something like gamma to the power of 60. Um, so you're amplifying any small deviations and noise quite a bit, which means that any error, any tiny error in the noise learning is going to get amplified tremendously, um, et cetera. So it's, it's much more sensitive. Uh, nonetheless, the average still works and it's still there. Uh, you can reduce that variance if you want by sampling more and more. Um, and that comes in again with this uh, trade-off of being able to run more circuits. That was one of the main challenges here was that at the time that we started doing the first experiments and I was running the first ones, I had to, you know, it, the setup was not meant, uh, was not made for really learn, uh, running a lot of random circuits. I think things have improved a lot now and it's a lot easier. Um, so that's one of the main, if you want trade-offs you get, you get bias-free expectation values, but you have to run a lot of circuits very fast. Cool. Uh, we have Boris asking, very impressive results. It seems this only deals with errors that can be twirled to a depolarizing channel. Does this work when leakage is fairly low in the first place? Does it work for? Uh, does, it, does this work when leakage is fairly low in the first place? Oh, great. I'm so glad you brought that up. I think if I didn't have that on my slide, I should have had it somewhere about leakage. It's a great question. Leakage is one thing that isn't immediately handled in here. And I think it's probably an open theoretical question. Um, you, you could add leakage into this list. Um, it hasn't really, so A, it's not a depolarizing channel. It's a, it's a stochastic poly channel. Um, B, the leakage doesn't seem to actually have been an issue for us operationally. And, uh, I think it's, it's an open question as to why and how much it is. Maybe when you do twirl so much, maybe that helps with it a bit, but, um, surprisingly it hasn't been hasn't been a limiting factor yet. So I think it's an open question. Uh, we have Jasmer asking if whether the noise is assumed to be Markovian. Yeah, good question. For the theory and derivations, you tech, yes, you assume it's Markovian because this is assumed to be a CPTP map. However, in practice, um, if, I mean, you can relax that quite a bit. You can say it's weakly Markovian. I think this will still roughly work. You can also include, um, this is fairly standard, but you can include it, the fact that these single qubit gates have error, and you can try to set up your single qubit gates in such a way that they all look like they have roughly the same amount of error, and that can be lumped together with this channel. So really what we learned here is the product of the errors of the multi-qubit gate and the single qubit um, twirling gates. Nice. Um, the other question is, can there be, uh, from Shashi, can there be a case where using complete knowledge of noise adjust our algorithm so we don't have to use the inverse noise gate and can correct results after measurement? What will be success probability? Um, let me see if I understood the question. So correcting the noise, oh, I see, correcting the noise. I think there are some trivial cases when you could do that. So for instance, if you know, if you have one qubit and you know what its noise is, let's say its noise is T1, and you're just measuring the exponential T1, the K curve of that qubit, uh, at any time when you get a value, all you have to do is you have to just divide by one over e to the power of, you know, minus T over T1 to undo the noise. Uh, it's somewhat trivial because you know exactly what the decay is. So that's a simple case when if you know the noise, you don't really need to mitigate it in the experiment. After the experiment, you can undo it. But I think more generally, when you're looking at a, at a general circuit like this, you're, you're not supposed 
you're running this because you don't really know what's going to happen ahead of time. So I'm not sure that you, you can get to do that. Oh. Uh, let me see, we have one last question unless more come up. It's from Jasmer. He's asking, will over twirling deteriorate the signal or making a leakage? That's a good question. So yeah, it's a very good question. So twirling can help or it can make things worse. It doesn't guarantee better results. Um, in the circuits that we ran here, for instance, uh, you, for, for this kind of construction, you already have lots of layers of single qubit gates. So adding a twirling gate doesn't really change the circuit structure very much. Doesn't add the depth, doesn't change the total time. It only adds one extra, you know, it only adds extra single qubit gate depth here. Um, if you have a circuit like a GHC and you suddenly start to twirl a GHC circuit at each layer, you're suddenly going to add many, many single qubit gates that you didn't previously have. And also each of those gates has a time duration that's going to get added. So the total circuit time can, can jump up quite a bit and then you can make things worse. So you have to be a little bit careful about your circuit and when you apply it and um, how, just how fast are your single qubit gates and how much infidelity they have. And uh, it, actually, I think a lot of, we might even cover some of this. I'll point this out then there's, uh, a, since it's coming up, we covered in uh, in the sorry in the global summer school QGSS uh, tw 2021, which was on quantum machine learning. I had this uh, one one or two days of six hours of lectures on really going into and talking about coherent noise, projection noise, state and preparation, measurement noise, incoherent noise. Um, so that's a good introduction, I guess, for folks that want to want a very kind of beginner first introduction into quantum noise. And then in this summer schools, uh, if there's enough interest, maybe we can even talk about twirling, uh, but there's quite a bit of uh, new material and awesome updates to come. So I invite you to, when, when this is announced uh, sometime soon, to sign up for our 2022 global summer school. We'll be, uh, we'll be giving a lecture, I'll be giving a lecture on quantum noise. Oh. Uh, okay, I think there is one last question. Um, seems like K over two needs to be controlled by growers to minimize over twirling. Um, let's see if I cut the question. Um, the reason that I had a K over two here in this protocol was simply because I wanted K to be the total depth and this particular block, which has two units to come, um, you know, it's depth two. So there wasn't any other reason for K to be, you know, for this to be K over two, but I might not have understood the question. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's all. Wonderful. All right. Thank you, Mirko, for being our host today. You did a great job. Thank you, folks, for all the many questions. Um, this talk will stay recorded on uh, this on the Hiskid YouTube channel, so you can go back and rewatch it. Um, there are there are probably some more notes. At some point, I'll post on on my blog about this talk, and maybe I'll post the slides if there's interest. So feel free to let us know in the chat. And uh, with that, folks. We'll see you next Friday at noon Eastern time. Thank you for coming.